Whenever, whenever I want? All right. Are we ready to have some fun? I say fun. All right. So on behalf of Adult Recovery, I'd, I'd like to welcome you. I'm Dr. Kevin Skinner. And a lot of people ask questions. Uh, why are you guys doing this? It's free. And uh, there's so many people uh, who are in therapy right now. Some of you uh, are going to 12-step groups. And believe me, I know more about you than you want me to know. And the reason why is because the first week, we really do an assessment to find out more about you so we can meet your needs. And one of our goals here is to understand the needs of women because our experience has been that we spend a lot of time working with the, I'm going to use, I'm going to use some words today, addict and uh, the person struggling with pornography or sexually acting out. And so a lot of support for them, but not a lot for the women. And so the ADO approach is to help support the women while they go through this time to see if we can help save more marriages if possible. And in the process here, today is all about you. The next five weeks are all about you. This, we will not be talking in depth about how to strengthen your marriage. We won't be talking about how to help your husband change. Sorry if that's what you're here for. <laughs> we're talking about you. And so over the next six weeks, we're going to be talking very specifically. Today is talking about betrayal trauma and the science behind it. We're going to help you understand that you're not going crazy, that you're actually quite normal. And you, some of you already know that because you've taken the online assessment and looking at the 800 other women who've taken the online assessment. Last night, I was pulling the final data, and I have over 1,000 people who've taken this now. So 1,000 women have taken this online trauma assessment. So the stories that I'm going to tell you are real-life stories, real-life, uh, what we would call kind of the means or the norms that are out there on some of the to be a trail trauma. And the reason why I want to do this is because I really, really want to emphasize that the trauma you're experiencing is very normal. And uh, let me give you a little bit of background into that. Uh, this isn't new for me. I've been doing therapy since 1995, and in particular dealing with pornography. I was working at LDS Family Services in 98, 99 when I was getting my PhD at BYU. And in one time, this is 98, we had 11 referrals, and seven of them in 98 were related to pornography. Seven of the 11. That was back in 98. Now, I, I don't work there now, but I can tell you that the numbers aren't changing. We're dealing, our culture is dealing a lot with pornography and sexual addiction. And so for me, uh, back in 2000, I had a religious leader come to me and say, hey, I've got a lot of people who are struggling with this, can I start sending them in your direction? I had no idea what he meant when he said start sending them in your direction. And ever since then, I've uh, it, basically my clientele is focused on helping uh, individuals struggling with pornography and sexually acting out and their spouses. And so uh, when Eric came to me, uh, the founder of Addo Recovery, he came to me and said, hey, we're considering trying to help the women. And at that point, I had already gathered a lot of research data on, on what the women's challenges are. And I thought, this is a great way. So our goal is to reach around the world and to create content that supports the women. And then also we have uh, a, an exciting workshop for men that's going to be starting in about three weeks. And uh, we, we'll give you more information on that if you're interested in nudging your husband into it. But um, <clears throat> here, here, here's the thing that I want to, to be very clear. This is not therapy. Right? I don't want to get you mistake this for therapy. This is educational content for you. Uh, we use the Therapy Rewind system because it allows us to give you assignments, to give you a place to journal, to give you a place to do some of the things that we want to do, assessments. But feel free to use Therapy Rewind even when you're done with this class. You're more than welcome to log in there. There's a library. There's a journal. There's a goal-setting place. That's for you guys to use for here on ever for your own use. All right, a couple other housekeeping things. Uh, we are going to try to start on time, uh, just in general. So we'll try to start around our noon and go to about 1. Uh, there are six weeks, and let me give you the full outline. Today we're talking about betrayal trauma, and next week we're going to talk about understanding you. And the reason why is I took the research that I've been gathering, and we looked at betrayal trauma, and then I said, well, what about depression, and what about anxiety, and what about stress? <laughs> And so I started looking at the results, and trauma levels and anxiety and depression were very similar. You're 
betrayal trauma goes up, your anxiety and depression goes up. So next week we're going to be focusing, you're going to get an assessment this week that looks at depression, anxiety, and stress. And uh, the reason why we want to do that is because what we've realized is this isn't just about betrayal trauma. This is about some re very legitimate emotional challenges that you're facing, maybe as a result of that. But are you depressed and are you anxious? And so we're going to give you an assessment on that this week, and we'll give you some feedback and talk about it more in depth next week. That week is followed up by uh, what I would call the four steps of really getting you moving forward to the healing process. And what we've done over the time is we've looked at what works. Really, I mean, I, I want to paint a big picture here for a second. Big picture. Right now, we, we are seeing the pain as this. And that's typically how we're experiencing. We're in the middle of the, I mean, if we're coming down, we're right in the middle of the fire. But I would need to help you see the big picture here. I know what works. I know what works for couples. I know what works for men who are in recovery. And I know what works for women in recovery. We, we know that. I mean, I literally, over the last few years, I've been studying, focusing on what is working out there. And I have stories that I could share with you of people who are making it through this hellish period of time. Is that the right word? Can I use that? All right. All right. So, so, so we know what works. I also know what doesn't work. So in week three, we're going to be talking about four things that just really can accelerate you in your individual life. I'm, again, this is about you, and this is not about your relationship right now. This is, this is just helping you normalize the chaos that you've been in. Because my experience is that many of you think you're going crazy, that you can't get your mind off this, you're not sleeping well at night. You can't even remember things. You start to be forgetful. And you're like, what's wrong with me? I used to be able to remember. So you're forgetting your keys and who you told what and who you didn't tell, and you start to think, what's going wrong here? And that's actually part of today's lesson is about this, what stress does to the body. All right, so that's week three. Week four, we're going to shift into, how do I describe it? Um, week four is a little bit hard for me because we do go a little bit into relationships, some relationship stuff in week three and four. We talk a little bit about boundaries, and that was a really hard one for me last time. And the reason why is because boundaries are very hard to do in this kind of a setting. Truthfully, if you're going to be talking about creating boundaries, you need to have your individual therapist, which gets me to a side note. If you don't have an individual therapist, you aren't going to 12-step group, can I just strongly recommend that you find support beyond here, just here? And, and the reason why is big picture. People who are coming to counseling, people are getting educated, people who are in 12-step groups do a heck of a lot better than those who are trying to do, with, do it on their own. So out of curiosity, how many of you are either in counseling or attending a 12-step group or both? Please raise your hand. All right. So those are just looking around. Just think about it. By the way, uh, welcome to our audience who's watching us uh, from wherever you are in the world. Um, like I said, we said earlier, there's probably about another 100, 100 individuals who are going to either be watching this live now or be watching it later on today or over the next week. So we've got a group of over 100 women who are participating in this series. If you find this helpful, please share it with your friends who also might be in need. This is, again, free service to the community that we try to help uh, women in your situation. All right. So week four, five, and six, we start moving. Uh, I'm talking about week four, trusting your instincts. And my, our experience has been this. When you're in a relationship where you've been lied to, you've been deceived, you begin to say, what is wrong with my instincts? Why didn't I see this earlier? What was happening? How did I miss it? How did I ignore it? Week four is all about trusting your instincts. Week five is probably my, well, I don't know, week five and six are probably my favorite. And the reason why is week five we talk about resiliency. And we talk about how to, how to how, literally, how to improve your resilient strengths. And for women in your situation, it is a very, very powerful concept. I've uh, had the opportunity to interview some world-renowned experts on resiliency, and I'll share with you what I learned from them. And then in week six, probably my favorite favorite, is uh, self-compassion. And I'm going to tell you right now that everything that we do here is built upon compassion. At our approach is built upon overall creating a compassionate environment where you feel safe and secure. And important to that is you feel compassion for self. 
because many of you have been beating yourself up, feeling like there's something wrong with you, body image issues, mind issues. You hate it, these dark emotions that this experience has brought into your life. And so week six is how to nurture and develop more self-compassion. So that's the six-week outline, and that's where we're going uh, over the next six weeks. Today um, is a little bit more on the hard side. So I'm going to speak about some normalcy of what your emotions are and what they've been. So in order for me to do that, let me get started with some of your stories. All right, these are your stories. And uh, the question, uh, what's the hardest part of discovering your partner's sexual behaviors? So again, I, I'm, 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 I'm paying very close attention to what you do online. I just want you to know that. I've looked at your trauma scores. I, I've looked at your answers. How stressed am I? Which we're going to be talking about a little bit about later. I've looked at you know some of your thoughts to these questions, and I, I just I just want to just give you a flavor so you can understand. Uh, I think the hardest part is that I never saw it coming. The lying made it very hard for trust to be restored. I thought he was different. A violation of trust. I think the hardest part is resenting the loss of the life I thought we were going to have. That's your stories. And so what happens with that is we have to go through a grieving and a loss process and we have to learn to redefine our relationships. And so that's one of the things that betrayal trauma creates. So let me look a little bit about betrayal trauma. Back in 1993, or 2003, 2004, uh, have you guys ever heard of Shondell Knowlton? Anyway, she's a friend, therapist, colleague that I went to BYU with. She's up in uh, Farmington area. Anyway, she's getting ready to retire. She and I were sitting at a conference uh, on How Can I Forgive You by, uh, what's her name, Janice Abram Spring. And we're sitting in this conference and we're sitting talking and she says, one of the things I just I keep seeing over and over and over is the women I'm working with are experiencing a lot of symptoms like PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder. And I said, thinking to my clients, I'm thinking, amen. But at the time, there was very little discussion of trauma. In fact, in this arena, we used to deal with women in your situation with the what we call the codependent model. And if you're familiar with the codependent model, they bring alcoholics in, and they would say, well, how are you enabling this behavior? Well, with the alcoholic world, you know, I was calling up and saying he was sick and I was making excuses for him and all of that. And they said, well, that's the model they knew, so they were using the codependent model dealing with sexual addiction. In the last few months and years, they've received a tremendous amount of flack with that because many of the women had no clue the severity of the addict's behavior. And so they're saying, well, what model do we use? Is it the codependent model or are we using something else? So more and more research, we're looking at the 2006 article that said, uh, these women, a significant percent are dealing with trauma, PTSD-like symptoms. So in 2003, 2004, uh, 2005, Shondell and I co-authored with Jill Manning uh, the, the trauma inventory that you took. And uh, like I said, we've had over a thousand women take that assessment, and what we're finding is that many women are experiencing elevated trauma. And so when you were answering, you know what you guys said. It doesn't surprise me, but what it did is it normalized your experience. Many of you wrote, "Man, this is like normal. I'm not, I'm not going crazy. I mean, it's you mean it's okay if I feel that kind of anxiety and I'm not sleeping well at night? That's normal, and I can't get this off of my mind." Yeah, that's all normal. And you keep reliving the experience and you can't go to the mall because you're scared. And you wonder, you know, watching television, is what's he thinking seeing that kind of a commercial? And so you're seeing the media, you're seeing the public, and everywhere you go and all of a sudden you want to put your head in the sand and you want to curl up a ball and cry in the closet for four hours. Oh, wait, you guys have done that one, right? Not, not that one? And half of you are laughing because you know what I'm saying is right. Because what happens is emotionally we don't know what to do with that. Well, how do I make sense of this behavior? I thought, you, I thought you were this. And so what we were coming to find out is what you're experiencing 
you're responding very normally. Our challenge is to figure out how to help you through that. Simultaneously, our hope is that your husband is getting help. Because if he's not getting help, then you're flying solo in the chaos. The storm's here, but you need to be a team. And so my hope is that your husband's reaching out and getting help. Some of you are here because, he, you, for you, but some of you are here whose husband isn't doing anything. Some of you have a husband who's doing everything he can. Some of you have a husband who's not ready for marriage, and he's try he got married thinking he was ready for marriage. And some of you are married to a guy who's just a genuinely a good guy who got trapped and is really struggling. It's, it's a range. I mean, I looked through some of your results, and some of your husbands are absolute jerks. I don't know how else to put it. And some of you who have husbands who are genuinely just, I mean, they're, they're, they themselves are genuinely seeking help. All right, so I'm telling you this because I don't want you to compare your story to anybody else's. All right? If you compare yourselves, you're going to be in trouble. Does that make sense? Your story is your story. And the reason why I have the assignment in there, how stressed am I, is because I want you to think about what you are thinking about. Does that make sense? So can I have a volunteer for a second? I need to get that out there to the volunteer. The vol here's, the, here's the question. How many of you completed the how stressed am I exercise? Some of you, all right. Would we have a volunteer who would like to talk about that? Be courageous. Just takes one of you. Yes, thank you. All right, so the, the how stressed am I exercise, just so you're aware, if you haven't completed it, it's really looking at your last week. And, and what I wanted you to understand here is we're looking at the last week and we're trying to understand, what have I been thinking about this last week? And our experience is that when you're in high trauma, the most dominant things on your mind have to do with how to make sense of the chaos. So, volunteer, take it away. What's your experience been? How stressed have you been this last week? Most dominant things, top five things. I moved. Yeah. I moved here yesterday, officially. So I mo I drove a moving van here to Utah all day yesterday, and I've spent the last five days sorting through my belongings with my husband. Oof. So my last week has been torturous, and but this is a long journey for us. You know, we the pornography is the smallest part, mm -hmm. and it's been going on for a lot of years. Um, but this last week. Previous to this last week, I've had a lot of peace. I know that this is the place for me and my children. Um, I don't know how to answer this question. Um, I'm here now, and I have hope, and I have a strong, overwhelming feeling that my happy season is coming. I know that my husband loves me. I know that he loves our children. He, d he has no desire for any improvement, and it continues. The behaviors continue and add and add and add. So my stress um, has been at its peak, but it's going to start. There'll be different stressors, stressors mm -hmm. of starting a home and helping my kids and that kind of thing. All right, so, so just a couple of clarifying questions. This last week, what's been on your mind besides the move? Is, are you beyond the point of feeling the trauma associated with his behavior? In other words, are you reliving it, or is your mind looking forward to a creating a new future. But, um, I'm glad you asked that because I was confused on how to fill that out. Um, so there's been the pornography, then there was some infidelity, and that was my main mm -hmm. absolute lose my mind. <clears throat> but that was a couple of years ago, and I've been doing a lot of things to help. I just wrote the question, am I, um, am I giving myself too much credit? Am I actually in a better place, or am I still just distressed and it's a different kind, and I don't know. What's interesting is it doesn't feel that way. Okay. I mean, right now, <laughs> right now it doesn't feel that way. Your language, your language feels like I'm comfortable with where I'm at and what I'm doing. It feels that way. It doesn't mean it's not stressful, but it feels like you're at peace with your decision. Thank you. All right. 
so, so what we take from this is, okay, we're in a move, we're in all this chaos, but think about what you're thinking about. And what we've found is that women in trauma, in the, living in the trauma, it is constantly on their mind. Does that ring a bell for you guys? So, so when it's constantly on your mind, what does that prevent you from thinking about? Please, comment. It prevents me from thinking about other things, like me and my husband get in these arguments and he wants me to like acknowledge things that I've done that aren't good. And I, I finally told him one day, I'm like, I can't even think about that. It's just, I can't even, I don't know, it's just like blocked from my memory. Like I don't even know how, how to respond to that because there's so many other things going on that are, I don't want to say more important, but are taking the forefront that mm -hmm. what you're saying to me does not even register in my brain. Yeah. So, so it's hard to, even, hard to even have a conversation because I feel so overwhelmed. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Now, that brings up a point of what betrayal trauma looks like. When your trauma levels are high, and I don't know how many of you read the article, uh, How Adrenaline and Cortisol, that start, an article on Adrenaline and Cortisol, Kaylee did a masterful job on it. But, but here's general, some general concepts. When your stress is elevated, and I don't know how your stress can't be elevated in situations like this, you get adrenaline and cortisol. Well, what's the two functions of adrenaline and cortisol? Fight or flight. But, but let's even go further. Adrenaline high, cortisol high. Cortisol actually makes it so your short-term memory is not able to go into long-term memory. Forgetful? Heck yeah. Because I'm, I'm in this state of this chaos, and you want me to remember what I did two hours ago? And you want me to have this kind of an intense conversation? I can't do it because my trauma level, my, my cortisol levels are literally high. So from a biological, chemical standpoint, when you have high adrenaline and cortisol, you are very forgetful. It's difficult for you to focus on anything else but the pain you feel. And cortisol... In its, in its, what it was created for was for a very short purpose. If you're constantly dealing with stress with adrenaline and cortisol in your system, your body begins to feel it. You get more illness, physical sick, visit the doctor more. Uh, in, in us, we actually begin to gain weight around this part of our body, both men and women, when we're highly stressed. So we are typically going to gain weight. We also, we can't digest food, so we have upset stomachs. So we typically lose weight or gain weight because we're eating for comfort. So we're literally starving ourselves because we can't process the food or we're eating so much because it's how we cope with it. Can you guys relate with that one? Right? I get a whole bunch of heads going yes. And the... And, and the forgetfulness. So now I don't even remember if I've eaten, but I don't even know if I'm hungry because I'm so stressed. Adrenaline and cortisol in its intensity over time, you don't sleep well, you can't relax. And when I say this is for you, one of the things that we're going to be talking about is simply relaxing. We're going to be talking about some self-care. Many of you probably have lost that part of your life because of what you've been experiencing. So we're going to talk about how to take care of yourself and the importance of that. All right, so betrayal trauma, what does it look like? Well, when we get adrenaline and cortisol, we're not, our bodies aren't too happy with us. Uh, on, the, on the more severe side, if it happens day after day, week after week, year after year, month after month, after month year after year, you're actually more prone to have strokes and heart attacks. So by the way, cortisol and adrenaline in intense levels, not too good for you. Short term, great. Long term, pass. Which means we have to learn how to slow down the body. We have to learn how to relax the body. So with my clients, if you're my, my client, what you're going to get is a whole lot of relaxation exercises. And so much so that I think my clients get sick of me telling them to breathe. Oh, so real quick, do this with me for a second, just for a second. Come in with me for your nose, through your nose. And exhale out hard. We're talking about a tough topic today, and so I need you to do that periodically. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're holding it in, you're going, and when you walk out of here, you're going to go, right? A little bit of relaxation. All right, just a little bit of relaxation. Okay? All right. Do you guys like the rain? 
All right, what does it feel like? What does rain feel like? Relaxing? It's a kind of this kind of day you want to curl up and watch a good movie, right? All right, me too. That's why you're here. Good movie. All right, you're laughing. Good. All right. So, so trauma, betrayal trauma, slowing down the mind, slowing down the brain. We're going to be talking about that a little bit more in depth in later weeks. All right, so as we go forward, we look at the results and reliving the experience, and we look at the cortisol and we look at the adrenaline. And here's what happens, and I think it's really important that you understand this. When you are in that kind of an environment and you don't know how to respond, what do you do? Cry. Yeah, we cry. What else do we do when we don't know what to do? We overreact. How many of you obsess about it? Yeah, okay. If I'm being honest, truthfully, that's me, right? I, I can't get it out of my mind. Well, one of the things that we're going to be talking about is strategies of how to move beyond it. Actually, the truth is, is it's going to be on your mind, so I'm not going to tell you to get it out of your mind because that doesn't work. That's just a bad strategy. To say don't think about that actually is like saying don't think about the pink elephant in the living room. And if I was quiet for a full minute and asked you how many times you thought about a pink elephant in the living room, you know, on average, how many times you think about the pink elephant in the living room? Five to seven times. So when you say don't, your mind does. Very important concept here. Very important. So we want to accept the fact that I am going to think about this at times. So I'm going to give you a couple of core strategies. One of them is called journaling. You, how many of you read the article, The Power of Journaling? Did we read that one? All right, let me just review a couple core concepts. The power of journaling, if I can tell you, if you want a healthy habit that's going to carry with you beyond this class, I need you to be journaling. How many of you are currently journaling on a regular basis? Raise your hands. Yeah, somewhat, come see, comes out a little bit here, a little bit there. Here's my strategy, right? I need you to journal for personal awareness insight every day. Every day I invite you to journal. Now, here's why. Many of you don't know who to talk to. Do I talk to a neighbor? Do I get online and get on these forums? Who, who, who am I talking to? Well, I want you to start by talking to yourself. My dad once said that it's okay to talk to yourself just as long as you don't start answering. But I'm going to revise that. It's okay to talk to yourself and please start answering. Okay? Here's why. Dr. James Pennebaker, he, here's what he found. Very, very important. I mean, really important. Okay? He's looking at people and really hard emotions. He says, I want you to write about your most difficult experience of your life. And I want you to do it for 20 minutes a day, three days in a row. He's looking at their medical records before this happens. He's looking at their medical records six months later. The people who wrote for three days, 20 minutes, on the most traumatic or difficult experience of their life, six months later, had better immune system, their T cells were up in their system, and their depression scores were lower. Now, toxic emotions, toxic thoughts. What's wrong with me? Why is he doing this? If I was better, he wouldn't be doing this. Do you guys want to add to this language? Yes. What if it never gets better? What if it never gets better? Do you guys want to keep going? Is there something about me in this? Am I internalizing it? How many of you would say you're internalizing this experience? Look around, right? Most of them. Most of them. You too? Okay, most of them. I was talking to the camera. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. All right. So, yeah, I'm talking to the camera. Them too. Toxic emotions. The language we use here is a dark emotion. The discovery of your partner's pornography, sexual misbehaviors, creates a dark emotion inside of you. How many of you have been angrier than you've ever been? Raising your hands. I'm not an angry person, though, am I? So how does this happen? 
Well, that's what we're finding with the betrayal trauma, with the post-traumatic stress disorder, is I'm angrier than I've ever been. That doesn't make sense, does it? Why am I, if I'm not an angry person, why is this doing this to me? All right? So we're trying to figure out that as well. So here's the concept. Where do you put those dark emotions or difficult emotions? Those toxic thoughts. Where do you put them? Stuff them down. Ignore them. Avoid them. And they're still right here driving you crazy. What are you doing with them? So we're going to start. We're going to have an honest conversation with this on paper. Now, you can also type it in the online journal at Therapy Rewind in a safe place. Safe place. If you want to destroy it afterwards, I don't blame you. But I need you to get it out. Okay, this strategy, the power of journaling isn't just an idea. It's a healing tool. And it's been found over and over and over to be effective with different audiences. I'm going to give you one story from that. All right, and I'm going to tell you the other side of it. So they were researching people, who, uh, college students, who were having good experiences. And one girl got into a fraternity that she really, really wanted to get into, but none of her friends did, close friends. And so she wanted to tell them, but she was afraid to, so she avoided it. And the researchers found that if you have good news and can't share it, it also makes you sick. Well, what happens when you have sad news bad news, toxic emotions, and you're trying to ignore it and you're trying to avoid it. What's that going to do to you? What's it going to do to your body? Many of you had to keep this a secret for weeks and months and years because people will judge us. And so you protected him. And you protected him because you didn't know what else to do and you didn't want to bring shame upon yourself and your family. Is that your story? Am I close here? So in that protection of him, you're dealing with this secret in isolation, going crazy, and your kids are like, what's wrong, Mom? Why are you always angry at Dad? And you can't tell him. And you're protecting him, because you're the caregiver. You're the peacemaker. You're the rescuer. So here you are dealing with it all by yourself. Now what we're trying to do is we're trying to give you a place where you can talk about it. And you can say, this sucks. I hate him today. I shouldn't hate him, but I do. Jerk. <laughs> uh, it hurts. And it's okay to be angry. And it's okay to cry. And it's okay to say, I'm really not liking him today. And if he comes close to me, I want to smack him in the gut. Or worse. That's what it feels like. That's real and that's true to you. That's what I'm trying to say. This is normal. But where do you go with it? So that's why I plead with you. If you don't have that outside group right now, journal every day. And if you do have that outside group, a 12-step group, counselor, use it as often as possible. Journal your pain. Don't let that toxic emotion reside inside of you because what happens is it begins to dominate you, it dominates your mind, and you get stuck. It's called... Oh. All right, I'm going to go here, so be prepared. Emotions, toxic emotions coming in, not going out. It's like constipation. It's called emotional constipation. And it's really not fun being very bloated. It's really discomforting. Really uncomfortable. And then when it does come out, it comes out in a blah! And you're angry and you're irritable and he's like, well, what's wrong with you? All right? You're so angry all the time. I'm not angry all the time. I'm just hurt. And so the way this manifests itself is we get angry and we aren't, wait, I'm not an angry person, but I'm acting angry. One of my least 
favorite stories or favorite stories to tell is a story where a client was describing how her husband had had asked her to pray with her when she was angry. And they got into an argument and she slapped him in the face. I don't recommend slapping in the face. But she had been carrying this guilt for a long time that she had become physical with him and had slapped him and hit him. And I said to her, therapists don't do this, by the way. I said, good for you. And she was like, I almost as if I gave her permission to be real. Now, I'm not an advocate of physical violence. But what I am an advocate of is being true to our emotions and learning how to express them in real ways. Real ways. I'm hurt. I'm scared. I'm afraid. Real emotions. Dark emotions manifest. I hate you. You're an idiot. You're a jerk. You might feel those too. Constructive emotions. I'm going to be okay. Are you going to be okay? Does it feel that way? Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But here's my invitation and my promise. You can and will be okay regardless of what your husband does. Is that okay? Can I say that? You will be okay. You are strong, and I'm going to prove that to you in week five. I'm going to prove that to you how strong you are in week five. Is that a fair? I know we have to wait till week five, but I'm going to prove to you how amazing you are just by telling you a few stories. All right, any questions at this point before we move on? Questions at all? Yes. If you go in, does that look like self criticisms, negative self talk? What's wrong with me? The question is what if you never get angry and it all comes in? Right? So the question I would ask back is what are the, what when it's coming in, what is it looking like? What's that what are those thoughts? Ranging from, okay, which I feel suicidal. By, by the way, that's a normal one, and I'll tell you a personal story on that in a few minutes. To where? At the very least, when it's on there, what's wrong with me? What's, we talk about that. So what's wrong with me to I want to die? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the most spiritual religious women I know going through her husband's infidelity. She said, there were days where if it wasn't for my children, I would have wanted to die, and I thought about it often. And it's so normal. That's a dark emotion. That's the dark emotion that comes because of this. And so now I'm going to tell you another story to help you understand this one. So a few years ago, I was talking with an alcoholic. Now, don't put an alcoholic, recovering alcoholic and a therapist together for too long because we talk about, well, I had to talk to him about the recovery process. So I asked him a question. I said, so how did you, how did you go through this recovery process? Because I want to understand how people recover. My, my brain is always curious. I like to understand human beings. I would like to understand recovery. And so I said to him, <clears throat> so tell me your story. And he said, well, my wife had left. And seven months I had been inebriated every day. So the Saturday morning, my daughter came in, pulled open all the curtains. The son came in. I'm like, oh, what are you doing? And she said, Dad, I'm not going to let you kill yourself by drinking yourself to death. And more important, no woman is worth dying for. So I'm taking you to a rehab center today. And for the first time in that seven month period of time, somebody reached out and said something very important in his mind. Those were three things, right? 
I'm not going to let some woman, even if it is my mom, kill my dad. Think about how much leverage you're giving to your thoughts when they're that dominant. That it says, it's so powerful I don't want to live. Those are not your emotions. Those are not your thoughts. Those are outside thoughts trying to get you to harm yourself. You're way better. And there's so much for you to do. But they will come because the pain's so high. And truthfully, most suicidal thoughts are just longings for peace. I don't want to die. But I feel so beat down. So I promise you, they'll pass and there will be a sunnier day. There always are sunnier days. But those feelings are very normal. They're part of the questionnaire that we asked because it's so normal. And many women said, yeah, I've had those thoughts. And my experience is that those thoughts, they ebb and they flow depending on the intensity of the conflict and the acting out behaviors. Right. Does that answer your question? But I, I guess I wrote down, is it necessary to get angry? angry? No. Right. Let me answer that question. No, it's not absolutely essential that you become angry. Some people say, well, isn't that everyone going to go through that? And my experience has been, no. Some people get there. And you might be surprised at when it comes, but don't be surprised by any of your emotions right now. That's one of the core things I also want to say right now, is do not be afraid of your own emotions. An emotion is just to teach you that something's not right. Does that make sense? I mean, think about it. What is your most dominant emotion? Any comments? Most dominant emotion? Pain. Pain. Anxious, fear, fear. Depression. depression, which would go into emotion like sad. All right, so so I need you to come with me to the other side of the page here for a second. I don't believe you. I believe that you guys are happy, wonderful joy-filled women. That's your natural disposition. Would you agree with me? I think naturally you guys are happy, joy-filled women who love to serve and help and give to other people. I think that's who you are. And I think... Oh, she's there. What if we've lost? It's the question. And you asked the question too, didn't you? It's, she's right there. She didn't go anywhere. She's living in the chaos. I mean, when you're in the chaos, it's hard to feel the real natural you. And my invitation is over the next six weeks is I want you to reclaim your identity and who you really are. Not who you've been in the chaos. Your natural disposition, you're incredible. You're happy people. Life's experiences create a lot of pain. But your natural disposition is you're amazing. Please trust me there. Trust your innate goodness. And you know, you feel what I'm saying is true. Don't forget who you are. The toxic thoughts, the dark emotions, the crazy chaos. He walks in the door and you're like, Bleh. right? You get in bed at night and you're like, can I, how far on this bed can I get away from him? I'm okay. I'm okay. All right. How are we doing time-wise? Five to one. Five to one. All right, I've got two more concepts. Do you have any questions before I move on to them? Question. I have a question, and that is, what do 
you do with the pain? I understand the concept of getting validation in other places. But what about the pain that you need your husband to hold and hear? Okay, so the question is, what do you do? You want your husband to hold your pain and your, your hurt. All right, so, so real quick. By the way, we're passing Kleenexes around here. If you'd like some, oh, well, bring some with you next time. Holding, whether he can or can't, I don't know. For any one of you, whether, whether right now he can't. But if he's going to do some work, he needs to see the big picture. And here's the, here's the point that I really want to get to because I think it will help answer this question. Addiction prevents intimacy. Addiction prevents connection. Addiction prevents closeness. Recovery enables closeness. Recovery enables intimacy and connection. If your husband is willing to seek help, if he's willing, then he can learn to be intimate. My belief. And here's why. My survey of women is 1,000. My survey of men is 7,000. If I could teach you about addiction, I would tell you that it's a disease. That they're sick. I'm not justifying the behavior. The behavior's wrong. But they are sick. And they need to have a big model. So they see the big picture of recovery. If they don't see the big picture of recovery, then they, they've tried it. I've tried a 12-step group. I've went to a counselor. And I'm not making progress. Well, wait, you aren't doing the whole picture here. You, here, here's the metaphor that we've been talking about here as we approach the men's program. You can't go to the buffet of recovery and say, well, I think I'll have a little bit of this cinnamon roll, and I think I'll have a little bit of this, uh, well, man, I'm kind of looking for potatoes and gravy tonight. No, no, no. If you're going to come to the table with an addiction, which is a disease, you can't come and just pretend like you're going to be at this buffet and eat a couple of this and that. You have a whole grouping of foods that you need to partake of. And that's the recovery process. But I promise you that when men engage in that, and some women, because also some of the women who've signed up over this are dealing with their own addictions. When you engage in the recovery process, there is a process. Most people don't realize it. The research shows that healing from an addiction, a disease, takes three to five years of recovery. And we go to a month or two of therapy and we think, well, that's not working. Well, our expectations have to be real. And so I'm not talking from kind of an idea. I'm talking the research. Everything that I'm teaching you is research-based. I'm not just kind of throwing this out there as in a good idea. I talk about journaling because the research shows it's really effective for dealing with trauma. I talk about self-compassion because it is a powerful way to heal from anxiety and depression. I teach you trauma because we need to help you realize that you're not going crazy. So right now, if your husband can or can't engage in this process, if he would just look at the big picture, and we can all maintain the big picture here, if he's in the recovery process, it may take three to five years. It's not going to be in a few short weeks or months of their therapy or 12-step groups. It needs to be therapy and 12-step groups and education and a whole lot more personal awareness. So can he? If he will engage in the process, he can learn. Because my experience with many of the men, and I, I'm going to tell you this because you need to hear it, men hate their own misbehaviors. Their shame, their guilt, their despair, their hopelessness, their out-of-control feelings. I promise you, I've sat with hundreds of men who literally are crying in my office Trapped, stuck, scared. 
it takes time and it takes confidence that I can do it, which is, gets me to my next point. If you understand addiction, and we tried, we covered just a little bit in the, in the sheets that we gave you, but if I could plead with you to understand addiction is a disease and we need to look at it that way. I mean, I, I, I've spent weeks, two weeks in the last three months with um, Patrick Carnes and his group at ITAP. And they hit me in the head over and over, and not me, all of us, in the head over and over and over with the concept of this is a disease. If it were diabetes, if it were cancer, if it was something, well, how would we treat it? And then I started looking at all the research, and I promise you this is a disease that we have to get real legitimate help with. And we have to have realistic expectations. So to answer your question fairly, can he learn? Right now he may not be able to fully hear your emotions. But he can learn. And people who go through the recovery process learn how to. Now, my final point today. I need you to believe in you. I need you to hear what I just said and feel what I just said. This is a self-worth battle we're fighting. This is a direct attack on your self-worth. His behavior is a direct attack on you. I need you to understand. I need you to understand that you are an amazing person and you can make it through this. Self-belief, I can do this. I am good enough. I do hard things. I don't know the answers right now, but I know I will make it through this. Self-belief is the most important part to all change. My goal for this class is to help you find more peace, more confidence, and the ability to make informed choices. I need you to make conscientious, informed choices. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I mean by choices? I mean I need you to understand that you have a choice. And how you respond to this, I want you to feel strong in your choices. Not weak, because that's not your true identity. Your true identity is you're strong. So as we start this betrayal trauma, quick review. Betrayal trauma, what you're experiencing is extremely normal. If you feel like you're going crazy, you're not. You're just normally going through the chaos. That's what you're experiencing. Cortisol and adrenaline, we need you to slow down. Take a few deep breaths more frequently. Practice yoga, meditation. Don't forget to write in your journal. Every day. Every day. I'm going to suggest 10 minutes at least. If you're emotionally having a hard day, just throw up on the paper. It helps you get emotionally unconstipated. It's like fiber for your emotional well-being. Okay. Truly. Put a little bit of fiber in that body so it flows out. I don't want those toxic emotions to stay. Right now I'm not talking with you about how to deal with your husband. I'm talking with you about how to take care of you. Do some self-care, and we, we, we have literally a whole part on self-care. that will It's really exciting. All right, next week we're going to shift our energy, and we're going to be talking a little bit about the other emotions that surround betrayal trauma, depression, anxiety, stress. I'm going to talk with you about how to deal with some of your anxiety, stress, depression. We'll talk about some specific things. If you take the online assessment that will come out uh, probably in the next two or three days, uh, it's called the DAS 21, Depression, Anxiety, and Stress, 21 questions. And what you'll find in that is uh, a, quite a bit of self-awareness. You won't be able to get the results, but we will be sending you the results. So you'll be able to look at those results and uh, see your scores. Uh, the reason why is the author asked me not to give out the results without 
be able to send you personal feedback. All right, are there any questions before we end? All right, in conclusion today, I want to thank you for being courageous and being here. It takes a lot of courage to come be here and a lot of tears. But if you'll stick with us in the next six weeks, we're going to paint a picture for you of how to take care of yourself amid the chaos. So I thank you for being vulnerable and coming today and the courage for being here. Thank you very much.